Good morning. <laughs> Please welcome Martin Tatar. So good morning to everybody. <clears throat> I think we are <coughs> all uh, pretty tired and have a uh, lot to do, so I'll try to be <coughs> uh, as concise as possible. Uh, but first, let me thank uh, Rodrigo and Amalia for uh, having <coughs> had the opportunity to join you for this uh, uh, week of dense week and intense week of uh, <coughs> workshop, lectures, and debate. It's been uh, uh, great to be here. I'd like to present uh, to you today, um, let's say, a research project that we are uh, carrying on in the office since uh, about two and a half, three years, uh, which is also pretty much uh, all, uh, <clears throat> at the center also of the topic of the work that uh, I have uh, asked the student to develop in this week. Uh, it's a project that actually is centered on uh, uh, the possibility of rethinking uh, the notion of domestic space. And it's a project that uh, was initiated out of, uh, in a way, the chance that we had uh, in the past uh, four or five years when we have uh, developed a series of proposals for social housing. And in fact, we realize that uh, social housing today is uh, pretty much just a sort of uh, a kind of financial or economic construction, that in fact there is pretty much little or nearly nothing that separates, in fact, uh, domestic space of social housing from traditional domestic space. So we understood that, in fact, uh, domestic space is still uh, pretty much based on uh, certain tenants, and that, in fact, uh, it's uh, perhaps time to rethink the architecture of domestic space. I say that this is uh, a research because, in fact, it's not only actually based on project, but it's uh, a work that uh, is based on both, uh, let's say, uh, design uh, work, but also on historical investigation, and I will very briefly <coughs> expand on that. And the idea is that, uh, or the, let's say the topic at the center of this uh, research is, uh, in a way, the relationship between uh, uh, architecture and labor, and how, in fact, uh, it is uh, possible, perhaps, today to rethink domestic space uh, in relation to the changing <coughs> working condition of contemporary society. So we have developed uh, a series of projects around this topic for various cities uh, uh, in the world, a project that uh, are different in their own nature. They, some are, uh, let's say, more research projects developed in occasion of exhibition. Others are, let's say, more traditional architectural projects. And today, I'd like to present uh, two work. The first project that I'll present uh, after uh, this short introduction is uh, a, um, a research that we did for the transformation of Office Park in Flanders, which is, uh, let's say, the northern part of Belgium, which is the region where we are based. And the second project uh, is a project that we did in occasion of an exhibition in Berlin last year for a communal villa for artists. But before starting, I'd like to very briefly make a sort of uh, a introduction to this research. And the first, let's say, point I'd like to make uh, is that uh, <clears throat> what we are, in a way, witnessing in the last uh, years is, uh, in a way, a shift, a very strong shift between form of material production towards form of immaterial production. Of course, this uh, is pretty much true since uh, various decades, and let's think of the rising of the service industry during the 70s, the 80s, especially in the 90s. But it is uh, certainly true that uh, in the last 10, 20 years, perhaps, uh, within uh, the affirmation of immaterial production, the performances, uh, common performances of our intellect, like uh, languages, communication, sociability, become in a way part of the sphere of work. So in fact, if uh, during the paradigm of material production, the factory was in a way the architecture where labor was performed, today in fact, the factory is not anymore the place of work, but the city, which is, beca which is becoming the place where these uh, let's say, common capacities of human intellect are, in a way, put at work. So is the city the place where today we work? The second 
<coughs> let's say, premise I'd like to make is that uh, in this research we have uh, actually tackled and we put at the center of our project a specific subject, which is, uh, a, let's say, the contemporary worker, which is something this, which is very well portrayed by this uh, photographic work of Jeff Wall of 1978-83. Uh, uh, it's a photographic work through which Jeff Wall has uh, portrayed a series of friends of him, uh, which are probably artists like, like him. And what is interesting in this, uh, in this series of photos is that in a way, the title is Young Workers, but indeed uh, we don't see any longer the traditional blue collar worker or white collar worker of, uh, that characterized perhaps the uh, second half of the 20th century. But we see actually new figures emerging, which is portrayed within the same technique, a sort of social realist portrait technique, through which actually the old workers were uh, traditionally represented. And what I think, uh, in a way, this uh, highlights a certain paradox between, uh, in a way, the merging of, uh, let's say, a new, of a new condition, of a new working condition, of a new working class, perhaps, uh, which is actually characterized by as we know, much less social welfare that, that the one that characterized previous actually working class. The second, and perhaps more related to architecture uh, premise I'd like to make is that uh, within uh, this uh, actually new form of production, where our capacities, uh, uh, social capacities are put at work, actually there is no boundary anymore between living and working, between uh, forms of production and forms of reproduction. In fact, we work uh, 24 hours a day, we work while we commute, we work when we are at home, we work all the time we you know, sit in front of our telephone. We work uh, in our sleeping room, which is more and more becoming a sort of office, but also, in a way, we work in traditional leisure space, which are not anymore actually leisure space, but more and more are becoming actually space of production. And this is uh, even, I think, uh, exacerbated if we think, for example, at how <coughs> companies like, for example, Google are attempting to transform the traditional office space into the house in attempt of domesticate uh, production space. And on the contrary, on, as I just said, how in fact uh, the house or the kitchen, for example, is more and more becoming an extension of our office. And despite all this, if we look at, uh, in a way, contemporary housing production, housing today is still pretty much conceived and produced as something which is completely separated by the realm of production. In a way, we can say that all uh, modern capitalist city has been produced on the separation, on the dichotomy between living and working, between production and reproduction. And in fact, housing today still is conceived as a safe refuge, completely detached from the realm of work, where we have the traditional living room, the traditional master bedroom, the traditional bedroom for the children. And in fact, well, the transformation that are in fact affecting domestic space are not there represented anymore. And in fact, the idea that uh, uh, the house, actually, what happened within the house uh, forms of uh, uh, social reproduction are at the service of uh, production, and that's actually, of course, something which is uh, very important, is uh, certainly not something that, it's something that is disguised behind, actually, a traditional form of architecture. And if this is uh, certainly true, I think, for the majority, let's say, or the large majority of housing production of today, uh, and of perhaps of the last uh, maybe 50, 60 years, it is uh, true that in fact this is, was not the case for uh, the history of our discipline, where in fact actually there has been uh, a lot of cases and a lot of interesting actually projects that have challenged these, uh, these very condition. And in uh, this research we have uh, explored, let's say, and built up a genealogy of uh, what we could call uh, collective and productive spaces. Uh, which in fact has, uh, have attempted to bypass uh, this uh, separation between living and working. I will just very briefly uh, point out some of these cases just to, in a way, explain and uh, maybe a bit more clear about uh, what we actually have analyzed. But in fact, there are, uh, this is just a short selection of, in fact, a much larger uh, historical investigation. 
The first actually interesting technology which uh, in a way challenged this uh, division is the, uh, the monastery, which in fact is uh, the first typology which uh, have, uh, in a way, in a way the, typ the typology which has invented the single room. The single room did not exist before. Uh, it's something that was uh, produced uh, uh, as a cell for the monk, which were, in a way, living together in a monastery. And this is the cell of the famous uh, Certosa di Emma by Galluzzo, which was uh, in the outskirts of Florence, which was uh, uh, sketched and visited uh, by Le Corbusier, which was very inspirational to Le Corbusier, which, in a way, is uh, in itself uh, a living and working space for actually one monk. But indeed, also, if we look at the entire monastery, it's quite interesting how this, uh, in a way, relationship between uh, the individual aspect of life and the collective dimension of life are, in a way, brought together with, uh, in a way, the sort of invention of this central space, which is the cloister. But also, and that's maybe the second reason that makes this uh, typology quite interesting, is that, in a way, in the monastery, which was, uh, indeed, a place for living and a place of work, as in fact a monastery were in a way self-sufficient a machine, in a way each single aspect of production was given a very specific special characteristic within the monastery. The second case which I think has been mentioned in one, some of the, one of the lectures before is the very famous phalanstery of Charles Fourier, which we all are very well known which is uh, a, a large uh, collective living unit. But the interesting aspect of, uh, despite, of course, the collective endeavor and uh, ethos that uh, was put in this architecture, what I think it's, what is very interesting in uh, Fourier idea was that, in fact, it's not only actually about uh, the internal galleries and how this space distributes the different function of, the, of, the, of, the, of this complex, but in fact, how Fourier understood that uh, social capacity, social, uh, um, uh, social aspect of life were very much important in terms of sustained form of production. And in fact, for Fourier, the garden, which was uh, contained by the arms of this architecture, were as important as, uh, in a way, the building, because in fact, in the garden, people would come together in a social uh, encounter and would be able to, in a way, support and sustain their own uh, interest, which in fact was uh, fundamental in order to maintain the level of productivity of this, of this machine. Another very interesting aspect is actually a series of, ex uh, of experiments around the home developed in uh, uh, the second half of 19th century in the United States. A call, uh, actually, it's a sort of tradition called proto-feminist, of which I show only one uh, plan, which is uh, um, the American home, uh, developed by, actually, two uh, sisters. And it's a very interesting project because uh, it attempts to completely transform the traditional house or domestic space, completely changing the inside of the house, but not changing, actually, the outside. So the house on the outside was... Uh, completely uh, traditional uh, forms of, uh, of house, but on the inside you clearly see how in fact the space is radically transformed by placing at the very core of the house uh, the kitchen, the staircases, a series of movable partitions that in fact would uh, make uh, uh, the woman the head of the house and not anymore the man. The woman would become actually the master, placed at the center and able to decide uh, through actually the, uh, this architecture, how in fact the house would be, would, be, would be organized. Another very interesting actually tradition is uh, the late uh, uh, Soviet uh, uh, architectural tradition. Uh, let's say the uh, work that has been developed uh, in a way uh, after the, the first experiment of uh, collectivization of housing. And among these, there is a couple of projects that I think are very interesting, has been inspirational for the work that I show later. The first one is The Green City by Ginsburg, which we, in fact, uh, propose uh, a, um, a pavilion, which was uh, basically a house for one person that were meant to be built on, uh, let's say, an open green space, uh, allowing for the possibility of uh, uh, forming, let's say, small group and interaction among a group of inhabitants beyond, let's say, the traditional uh, uh, format of the family. Uh, and uh, these pavilions were distributed in a, a large open space, and then actually collective facilities were actually located in uh, other parts of these large green cities. 
Another interesting aspect of project is the famous linear city of Magnitogorsk by Leonidov, which in, fa in fact is a, a sort of criticism of uh, the large-scale collective tradition of, uh, let's say, first wave of Soviet architecture, where in fact uh, Leonidov proposed actually much more uh, smaller scale uh, cooperation among inhabitants, which is uh, actually in a way quite interesting, especially if uh, we think of the rising interest towards a form of uh, sharing and uh, small scale collective living that in a way are rising today in many parts of Europe. <laughs> so having said that, I mean, there would be, as I said, uh, many other cases, uh, we have actually Parallel to this, let's say, historical work, we have actually developed a series of projects, and uh, today I'd like to show you a couple of them. The first one is uh, a, a project which is called uh, Every Day is Like Sunday. Uh, it's a proposal for transformation of uh, derelict uh, office park in, in Flanders. And it's a title that uh, I think is, uh, in a way, very well explained by the experience that uh, uh, each of you could have by visiting one of these uh, actually places a condition which uh, is characterized by a mix of uh, boredom and tranquility, or say dullness and monotony, something which was uh, very well portrayed by a series of photos of these spaces that Louis Balz took uh, uh, in, the past, in the past years. But in a way, it's quite interesting to uh, ask ourselves what actually an office park is. Office park is uh, actually a cluster of uh, office building uh, located in a green area, in an open space. And uh, in fact, if we try to better understand actually the meaning of park, we have to first of all consider that the idea of park uh, is something that uh, appeared in the history of, uh, let's say, uh, the city only, let's say, in late 18th century. But that uh, actually is a word that etymologically refers, it's an uh, ancient uh, German word, uh, it derives from an ancient German work, word which is paruk, which in fact uh, it does not really uh, describe a, a large green open space, but in fact it stresses the importance of actually the fence, the edge of this space, meaning that in fact the park is indeed uh, a green space, but actually it's a space which is strictly defined, which is actually a very clearly defined compound. And I think it's quite important in order to, you know, to in fact, uh, a little bit think about, uh, in a way, the, the rise and the history of this urban form, which is actually an urban form which uh, is so much uh, widespread and present, I would say, throughout the entire world, and perhaps is uh, an urban form which is uh, not, a, which has not been studied, uh, if not actually with few ex recent ex examples of research that has been carried out in the United States. So on the one hand, uh, there is uh, an attempt to, let's say, escape from the city, so to locate, uh, 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 let's say, uh, to in a way leave the city and to go and into a large open, spa uh, open space. But at the same time, in a way, there is uh, a very much uh, kind of urban dimension, which is, of course, uh, this bringing together of, of, of uh, office buildings. And one can argue, I would say, that uh, in a way, if we try to trace what would be the origin of this uh, urban technology, we could uh, go back to the Roman villa, and this is uh, the famous Roman villa in the Oplontis in the south of Italy, which somehow is a sort of uh, ancestor of the office park, in the sense that the, the Roman villa was uh, a pretty much uh, incorporated this ideology of, uh, of leaving the city, of being located in a sort of suburban environment, but actually, in order to be uh, sustainable, this form of living, at the same time, the villa was not just actually a place of recreation and leisure, but was an incredible uh, uh, machine, economic machine, uh, in order to actually be able to sustain life taking place in uh, actually this uh, place. But indeed, in the, in the Roman villa, and that's actually quite interesting, uh, all uh, the production that was necessary in order to sustain life in, uh, uh, in, uh, in this actually remote condition, rural condition, was hidden behind actually the architecture of the villa itself. And all the production was happening in the uh, Villa Rustica, which was actually a structure which was detached from uh, the architecture is, uh, itself, which in a way anticipate the actual condition where actually house is a sort of uh, disguising behind the architecture all actually the, its role as a form of maintaining a level of reproduction. This would, uh, 
got stuck. Yes, these actually change in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, with, uh, with Palladio, who actually has inv have invented a uh, sort of uh, architectural monster, which is, uh, in fact, uh, a, a, let's say, a hybrid building between uh, a, a, a small palazzo, which, which has actually, which has even, uh, in a way, um, enhanced or uh, exacerbated by the use of the pediment, which for the first time is used in Palladio in, uh, in profane building and not only in uh, actual temples. And in fact, the uh, placing next to this uh, central part, this temple of the Barchese, which on the contrary were very humble and straightforward architecture, which is where in fact the place where uh, productive activities necessary in order to maintain the life of the villa were actually performed. <laughs> and in this case, uh, production is not, uh, is not hidden, actually it's pretty much visible. And in fact, they have, uh, the Barchese established a direct relationship between, uh, the, let's say, the agricultural realm where uh, the economic activities in order to maintain the life of the villa were to be performed. So the Barchese are, in fact, nothing classical. They're, in a way, very simple. And uh, certainly, in Palladio, the idea of nature is not uh, any more ideological, but somehow become, let's say, really, actually productive. But then we come to the, let's say, the first wave of uh, office park, which is actually pretty much different from the office park we have dealt with in our project, which is, in fact, uh, let's say, the more uh, uh, epical, let's say, phase of, of of, uh, of Office Park, which is uh, clearly exemplified by this uh, uh, gigantic structure by uh, Kevin Roche built in Connecticut for a huge corporation, which was the Union Carbide, uh, where, in fact, actually, you can see that there is no relationship, again, between uh, uh, the building and the surrounding Versailles-like nature that surrounds the building, which is just, in a way, a huge park which, uh, in a way, is, uh, has no actually productive, facility, productive role, but in fact is just actually an aesthetic element, enhancing or uh, improving or, in, let's say, uh, providing actually a nice setting for these uh, production activities to take place. But of course, this, uh, let's say, first wave of huge uh, structure of office park built in the middle of nowhere is uh, quite short-lived. And in fact, first, uh, uh, very soon we come to, in a way, a dim dimension or a character which is more similar to the one uh, that we have today in Europe, uh, which is the one uh, of the research campus. Uh, in this case, is uh, Palo Alto in California, where in fact we can see that uh, the nature has been uh, radically eaten up by uh, parking facilities or by the industrial park, where in fact actually uh, all uh, green is basically not existing anymore, and it's just basically a huge surface of tarmac for, uh, for parking for cars to be actually host. This typology, very interesting, is uh, imported in Europe in the 80s and 90s, where in fact we have the boom of uh, a service economy, and in fact, uh, it's a typology that uh, is uh, quite successful, especially in, uh, in, in Belgium, where in fact uh, developers understood that uh, Belgium is to become a sort of headquarter of Europe. It's a, a sort of long process through which actually Brussels become, became the capital of Europe. And in fact, the developers start adding a huge amount of office space in the city center, but also in the outskirts of the city. Um, and it's quite interesting that in the specific case, uh, actually, of Belgium, this uh, very speculative and uh, um, private, let's say, uh, investment or, or, or um, in a way, project are actually strongly facilitated by huge tax deduction that the government was applying to developers for actually building these, uh, these kind of, uh, this kind of compound. And they're building that, uh, generally speaking, of course, we will uh, now go a little bit more carefully into that, that, are in, uh, that have been actually built very quickly, generally speaking. A large amount of them are in a deep crisis, meaning that they are completely, in a way, vacant, and actually nobody wants to you know, be there any longer. Interesting is that their own uh, generally by one developer or, uh, let's say, a real estate company, 
which in fact uh, make somehow easier to think of, uh, let's say, possible uh, second life of these structures. And there are structures, of course, which uh, have uh, been subject in the last year of uh, a huge, uh, let's say, loss of, uh, of values, which in fact could be, uh, and that's actually the hypothesis of our work, could become actually the trigger for, in a way, a process of redistribution of this property. But in fact, we approach uh, you know, the idea of transforming of these, uh, of these uh, plays, not really from, let's say, uh, focusing on the, on the condition of the office park, but in a way from the vantage point that uh, uh, there is a huge amount of uh, need of housing in, uh, in Flanders. And it's estimated that uh, by 2030, let's say 300, approximately 300,000 new uh, housing units will need, to be, will need to be built. So in fact, uh, we see that, uh, uh, and that's perhaps the, the, in a way, one of the hypotheses of the research, that rather than in a way perpetrating uh, the sprawling of the let's say, countryside, which is pretty much uh, a Flemish condition, perhaps these, uh, or at least some of this side, could become actually place where, let's say, new forms of living and working could actually take place. And indeed, they are characterized. They have certain features which I think uh, uh, potentially could uh, become interesting. They have, as I say, the clear boundaries. They have one owner. There is uh, actually a certain amount of, uh, you know, not very nice, uh, but still a, a structure, so office structure. But there is still actually quite uh, an amount of, uh, of parking space that could be actually used or appropriated. Um, and in a way, actually, this architecture, although it's uh, in a way not, let's say, uh, very qualitative, still it has quite of a sort of generic character that in a way makes the transformation or the process of transformation actually something that uh, perhaps uh, it's, it's quite possible. We have actually, uh, in our research, look at, uh, in a way, the made, build up a sort of atlas of, uh, of office park in Flanders, and we have uh, recognized that, uh, in a way, the one that uh, are in crisis the most are, of course, the one that has been built in the first, let's say, two waves of office park, which also are typologically different. Uh, while, in fact, developers today are uh, trying to reinvent uh, the topic of the office park by increasing a lot the density and by enlarging uh, the green features uh, around of each of these, uh, these compounds. Also, actually, quite interesting is that uh, uh, these, uh, of course, uh, uh, structures are indeed located in, uh, let's say, the outskirts of the city. But they are also, in a way, pretty much well uh, connected in terms of infrastructures. And although everybody thinks that, uh, and they were being conceived as, in a way, being places where everybody would go to work by car, in fact, because of this strategic location, they are actually quite uh, accessible also by means of public transport. Uh, so these are actually uh, all office park. And then another actually important, let's say, aspect, or let's say, uh, point of entry of the research was to actually imagine that uh, these, uh, uh, let's say, office park indeed could become a new place of living and working, but that especially certain, let's say, forms of uh, uh, craftsmanship or new forms of material production could actually take place in this space. And we have actually built a quite, uh, uh, perhaps, sketch, a taxonomy of uh, productive space and we have realized that, uh, especially in, uh, that in this region, space for material production are normally quite large, and there is no actually possibility of uh, having, let's say, space where productive activities can take place in small size, which is actually something that today is uh, most desirable, especially by one-man company independent uh, uh, small, small, let's say, a group of professionals. So the idea of the project is indeed to provide actually working space that are in a way much smaller than the traditional one, but at the same time in a way retain the flexibility and the possibility of being transformed over time. Uh, in our, let's say, test, we have, uh, I think, focused especially on, uh, a, let's say, the outskirts of Brussels, although, of course, these are uh, present uh, both also outside Ghent or uh, the city of Antwerp and especially actually in uh, the area of uh, the international airport, where in fact there, is, uh, there are actually a huge amount of, of office park, and actually the ones that are in the most crisis are actually all located in that part. So this is uh, actually a plan that shows uh, how this uh, could, uh, even, uh, could be actually be re easily reached uh, by the current, actually, system of public mobility. 
And we have actually developed uh, a three different, uh, let's say, transformation strategy for, uh, for, uh, these, uh, for these uh, existing office park. The first strategy is, uh, a, let's say, quite, uh, want to be actually a very quick uh, a strategy of transformation of uh, not an entire office park, but of uh, a single office building. Uh, of this actually very simple, straightforward, prefab concrete, uh, a two floor height office building, and strategy which is uh, called uh, the cell, which in fact is uh, pretty clear. I mean, we will uh, look a bit more carefully later, but in a way, it's about actually uh, uh, keeping each of these buildings with uh, a, a, an outer, let's say, ring of space of living. The second strategy is uh, called the edge, and uh, in a way deals with uh, those office parks which are actually pretty dense, uh, where actually there is no real space uh, to add anything within basically the space in between the present office building, and therefore where actually the only possibility is uh, to build uh, uh, along the edge of this of these compound. And the third strategy deals with actually those uh, office, it's called the field, and deals with uh, actually those office park where, which has actually more generous availability of open space, which therefore could uh, actually be colonized by, let's say, new structure, which in fact would, uh, a, 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 let's say, complement the present uh, a, a buildings with the new living space. So let's start quickly from the first strategy. This is uh, the plan of one of these uh, uh, office buildings, which is uh, a very simple, uh, let's say, concrete uh, uh, column structure with uh, partition. Uh, the scenario of the project is uh, each of these, let's say, buildings could be, in a way, occupied or um, could be taken possession by a group of, uh, say, of people, let's say, freelancers or artists. Uh, let's say people that live in a different uh, um, condition from the traditional f uh, family, and that actually could come together and let's say share one of these buildings. Uh, the hypothesis is to, in a way, provide a very small uh, space for individual living and to actually offer inside this building, let's say, a quite a generous amount of uh, um, shared space, uh, living rooms, working spaces, uh, storage spaces uh, that in fact, uh, in a way, would uh, uh, support the life of these inhabitants. So the idea is uh, to first of all get rid of uh, all partitions and to add uh, a kind of, uh, and the facade, which is basically uh, at the moment just uh, prefab concrete uh, panels. Uh, actually, it's quite interesting, they are all uh, the same, so there's been one, uh, in a way, probably uh, cast that has been uh, used for all office park in, uh, in Flanders. Um, and to add a sort of circulation ring outside, basically, the uh, outer facade, which, in fact, uh, it's uh, also an attempt to, in a way, change the current condition of circulation, which is pretty much, let's say, a functional element within the building, into something which uh, acquire a much more ritual aspect within actually the way you move through this architecture. We only, of course, re retain uh, the staircases and, uh, and the bathroom. And when actually this, uh, let's say, first action is done, in a way what uh, we suggest is to, in a way, attach around uh, basically the building, a, a group of, uh, let's say, cells for individual living, which are basically just a space for uh, one to be on himself, who has a bed, a bathroom, and uh, very minimum, let's say, a storage space, while in fact all, uh, uh, let's say, other aspects of life are contained in this, uh, let's say, a central space of the building, which is uh, in a way quite uh, flexible, can be modified uh, with movable partition, and it can be used for both, actually, production and reproduction. So this is uh, uh, how this uh, is applied to building of different size. This is actually the axonometry of one of these uh, 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 cell. And this is actually the overall transformation. This is actually the image that uh, is uh, basically showing the added uh, a ring, or a ring of circulation with the cell on the left side, and in fact uh, revealing the different uh, possibility of use of the shared space uh, on, on the right side of the image, which uh, then could actually become something like that. The, same, the second strategy 
is uh, uh, the edge, uh, which uh, is, uh, in a way, a step forward compared to the previous strategy in the sense that uh, it tackles the entirety of uh, an office park. And as I mentioned before, in a way, it's, uh, it, uh, it focuses on uh, those uh, office park where the space in between the building is uh, extremely limited. So in fact, the only possibility to, in a way, add the space of living, of living is to, in a way, work on the edge of the office park itself. Um, and indeed, because of what I was mentioning before, because of these, uh, let's say, compound are, in a way, located in, uh, are quite strategically located and accessible both by motorways and, uh, uh, and uh, railways, Actually, it makes this uh, place uh, quite subject uh, of disturbance by, let's say, noise pollution, which in fact means that if you want to transform that into a place of living, you have to somehow actually protect the space of this, of this uh, building. So in such a case, uh, uh, the edge, of course, becomes a sort of wall, which, uh, in a way, protects uh, the inside from the outside where actually the building on the inside, the present building, the present office building, are transformed into a workshop and laboratories, while in fact the living are contained actually into these, uh, let's say, living, into these living, into these living walls, edges. Um, so this is uh, actually a few attempts that we did with the actually present uh, uh, office park. This is a plan. This is another axonometry. And then we have actually uh, quite a, a thought about uh, the living typologies. And uh, each typology, in a way, is based on uh, uh, one, let's say, principle, which is the principle of providing, basically, one single room, which is always the same, uh, which, in fact, is an attempt to, uh, to produce a domestic space which is not uh, any longer bespoke to traditional family living, where you have a larger bedroom for uh, parents, a small bedroom for the children, small bedroom, even smaller room for offices, but actually something that is much more, let's say, open to be, in a way, appropriated and used in different ways, which, of course, can be traditional family living, but can also be something actually quite... Uh, actually quite different from that. So something which is, is uh, in a way, we believe uh, much more flexible than uh, the architecture of traditional apartment. So in fact, uh, uh, the room is a room for everybody. It's a room which contains uh, a bathroom, which contains a general storage space, which has uh, a lodge on the front. Uh, but rooms which, of course, can also come together into forming different apartment. Uh, we were also pretty much interested in uh, the attempt of liberating uh, domestic space from uh, uh, the traditional way through which domestic space is defined uh, by traditional furniture, especially in an age where you know, people are much more movable and uh, live in place for a shortened period of time. And to avoid actually the fact that all the time you relocate somewhere, you have to go to Ikea and buy you know, the same bunch of stuff everywhere, which then... Uh, and then you put that in your room, but actually to, in a way, develop an architecture which is uh, both the space and the furniture for the people that actually would come to live. So that, in fact, here you have uh, the bed, the bathroom, and, uh, in a way, a huge shelf that can be used as a quite generous storage space. <clears throat> On, in the center, of course, uh, the existing building are retained and transformed, in, as I mentioned, in, uh, into, into laboratories, while actually the space in between buildings from actually a huge uh, extensive concrete thermal surfaces is transformed into uh, uh, an available services for leisure and sport. A few images. The third strategy is uh, uh, perhaps the one, uh, it's called the field, as mentioned before, which uh, in a way is, uh, it follows the same logic. It, uh, it attempts to retrofit the space uh, in between uh, buildings by inserting, uh, let's say, strip of housing, which are in a way broken by the presence of this existing uh, working space. Uh, indeed, uh, uh, the attempt was to develop something which is actually quite dense, and also something that uh, in an age where everybody wants to live in the city, wants to be in the center, 
uh, it could also offer, let's say, a certain level of, uh, uh, of density and uh, in a way of, uh, let's say, social interaction, actually in a site which are in normally not actually considered site where this actually could take place. We have also, in a way, and that's something that is uh, common, let's say, to all the projects, attempt to, in a way, minimize uh, space of, uh, you know, the space of individual living, also because uh, certainly, of course, uh, uh, there is an economic side uh, attached to that, but there is also, in a way, the attempt uh, to offer something which is not actually uh, too much, uh, that does not need too much uh, uh, housekeeping and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, maintenance, but something that, in fact, uh, reduces the energy that uh, traditionally you have to put in order to actually sustain very large, very large domestic space. So something that, in a way, is uh, generous, is uh, somehow even monumental, but at the same time does not actually exceed in the, in the, in the amount of square meter that are offered to each, to each inhabitants. So these, uh, okay, these are a few of the plan of these uh, uh, office space and how they've been uh, transformed. But let's come to the, to the uh, plan. Uh, uh, in this case, we have uh, uh, produce actually a housing system which is based on actually a repetitive system of inhabitable walls, so something that we have already experimented a lot in a previous project, which is somehow a tunnel house topology with the mezzanine, where in, but where actually all, again, function and services of the house are concentrated in the series of parallel walls, which also become the structure of the house itself. So it's something that uh, in plan perhaps look uh, uh, quite rigid, but that in fact is something that becomes quite flexible in section, where in fact this space on the ground floor could become in a way both actually a place of living and could become of course a very generous living room, but at the same time can also be used uh, uh, quite freely uh, thanks to this actually very defined architecture as uh, a sort of space where you know, small production activities could take place and also something that could be extended uh, in uh, having uh, actually giving to all inhabitants the possibility of uh, expanding into this, uh, let's say, common space which is in between, uh, in between these rows of houses. The second project I'd like to pre uh, quickly present is uh, a, a work that we developed in uh, the occasion of an exhibition that took place in uh, Berlin last year. The exhibition was called The Wohnung Frage, a clear quotation of uh, Engels' book on the house in question. And we have been asked by the organizer of the project to actually develop, to work together with uh, a, an initiative, a group of artists that were attempting to develop a sort of collective uh, uh, atelier and living space in, in Germany. Uh, actually, they were trying to do that in the city of Frankfurt, and we have helped them, let's say, or work with them in order to develop a prototype for communal living in the city, in the city of Berlin. Um, the, pro the title of the project is Communal Villa, which, of course, is a, a voluntary attempt to distort uh, uh, the very essence of the topology of the villa, which is, of course, the most uh, individual form of living that you can think of. But at the same time, it's also, of course, a quotation of uh, uh, the urban villa of uh, uh, the concept developed by Oswald Matthias Ungers, which, in fact, uh, at, the, at the time, developed this idea of the urban villa as a, as a small-scale typology through which, actually, the city could be, could be actually transformed. Um, the project was uh, based on, uh, uh, let's say, three uh, general conditions. The first one was that we were, in a way, in this case, uh, uh, work within, uh, let's say, the framework of uh, uh, the syndicate of tenants, which is a sort of organization uh, which is promoted, uh, promoting public ownership in Germany. Uh, and which guarantee buildings from uh, uh, speculation and hostile takeovers. And uh, actually, we have been uh, attempting through this group of artists that were uh, working within this, uh, let's say, economic framework to develop something that would fit into the economic framework that this organization is putting forward. But also something that, in fact, is uh, in other form uh, and in other, let's say, um, 
institutional form is uh, taking place in other countries of Europe. And so we saw that it was actually quite interesting to, in a way, frame the project within, uh, uh, let's say, this condition of, uh, let's say, public ownership. We have uh, uh, made uh, an extensive research into uh, something which is uh, uh, into the site. And uh, we have mapped and uh, looked at uh, the way and found a huge amount of uh, a a new plot of land which are present today uh, in Berlin, which in fact uh, have very much to do with the legacy of the city. Uh, and we have actually, in a way, look, found that there are an enormous amount of these, uh, of, of the, of, in a way, neglected, abandoned sites in Berlin that look pretty much like a site like this, uh, which are, in a way, in many cases, uh, sites that are, in a way, uh, not. Uh, zone in uh, within the current city master plan, which are sites which, uh, in a way, in many cases, are very close to uh, large public infrastructure and therefore actually are affected by, let's say, also in this case, uh, noise condition, but sites that, because of this condition, could, uh, in a way, be leased or rented at, uh, in a way, or acquired at lower prices. And sites that uh, are also, in a way, characterized by, let's say, a sort of unexpected beauty, a sort of green setting which, uh, in a way, paradoxically evoke uh, the picturesque setting of, uh, of, traditional, uh, uh, of traditional villas. Uh, so we were actually interested in, uh, in a way, working with this side that uh, are uh, very close to the rural condition where villas are located, but that, in fact, uh, are pretty much actually present within, uh, uh, within, the, within the boundary of the city. And as I said before, in a way, are sites that uh, are interesting because, of course, okay, they are affected by noise, but they are also, in many cases, uh, close to station of public mobility and especially of the metro, of the metro system, which is uh, pretty much uh, quite spread in the city of Berlin, that, in fact, could make this site actually quite accessible to people that, in fact, do not move with, uh, with, uh, by cars. The third condition of the project was, uh, in a way, to a little bit focus on uh, uh, construction and technology. And we have uh, thought that this project actually uh, sh should have been built uh, as uh, an industrial building. And there were two options, a steel uh, structure and a concrete structure. The concrete being, uh, let's say, used for the more urban of, let's say, the communal villas and the steel for the more suburban of the, of the urban villas. But the whole idea was uh, to get completely rid of the level of the finishing, which is, uh, in a way, as especially to get rid of the impact that finishing has uh, on construction cost. So, in fact, the idea was to, in a way, provide the living space, which, in fact, uh, is pretty much uh, uh, built as if it would be actually a, 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 an industrial building. So something that, in fact, uh, has uh, quite, I would say, even an unprecedented low construction cost. So the plan of the villa, and this, in this case, I will, uh, in this presentation, I will, uh, I think, focus uh, mostly on the suburban villa, uh, which is the steel, uh, uh, the steel one, the steel structural uh, villa is actually a plan which is uh, extremely simple. It's uh, actually based on, uh, a, again, one uh, special principle, which is to, in a way, maximize uh, uh, the collective space of these artists, where actually they would have and share their own uh, studios, workshop, and all uh, the other, let's say, collective amenities, like kitchens and uh, saunas and pools, uh, which are located and they occupy the central space of this building and to minimize, uh, of course, to a certain degree, uh, individual space which is uh, actually located along the edge of, uh, or the outer perimeter of this, of this building. And actually, the outer perimeter is uh, all built uh, uh, through the repetition of uh, one module, which is what you see uh, highlighted or drawn, which is actually a room uh, uh, measuring uh, 7.5 by 7.5 square meters, and uh, with uh, a ceiling height of five meters, so it has actually a double height. And indeed, what you have seen, uh, in a way, drawn in this element is, uh, in a way, the only uh, fixed partition of the entire construction, which is uh, what we have called uh, uh, the inhabitable wall, which is, in a way, something uh, in between uh, furniture and architecture, let's say, 
It's uh, an inhabitable wall which is built in, uh, in uh, plywood, um, which is in fact the element that separate uh, the public dimension of the building from the public, private dimension of the building, of the private space of individual living. So each of these uh, inhabitable walls, and now we focus on, let's say, the one of uh, one single room, uh, is uh, actually basically the element that in a way express what is the architecture of the villa. For the rest, the villa is basically a skeleton structure, very uh, straightforward. It's basically still a box, with the exception of this element, which is, uh, uh, as I said, uh, made of uh, a playwood and which has two sides, of course, so the side towards the collective space and the side towards the private space. On this, uh, uh, on this axonometry, we see the elevation of this element towards the, um, towards the, um, uh, the private space of the room, which uh, where actually the inhabitable wall contains uh, the wardrobe, the entrance, of course, to the space on the right side, uh, the wardrobe, uh, the bathroom and the small stairs which bring you up to actually the uh, alcove where uh, sleeping is uh, actually taking place. On the outside, the same uh, inhabitable wall becomes a sort of uh, large storage space where each of these, uh, let's say, artists in this case uh, or inhabitants can uh, keep their own belong belongings, their own uh, piece of work, piece of art, their own uh, production material. <laughs> so this is actually the uh, image of uh, the room from, uh, from the inside. It's uh, um, actually the entire villa contains or hosts uh, 50 inhabitants. Uh, it's a fourth, where well, we will see later the section, it has four floors, so there are, uh, uh, yes, quite actually big. Um, but also we have, uh, in a way, in developing these uh, um, piece of furniture, let's say, or inhabitable wall, we have also attempted again to, in a way, emphasize the abstraction of the architecture itself, and uh, in a way to get rid as much as possible. Of course, probably that's not possible uh, uh, entirely, in, uh, in, 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 it's not possible in, in a complete terms, but to get rid, in a way, of uh, stylistic concern, of, uh, in a way, decoration, of character, of representation, which are always, in fact, used in traditional domestic space uh, in, in order to characterize what a space is to be used for. But in fact, the idea of this, uh, of this project was, uh, in a way, to develop something which, uh, in a way, was flexible in the sense that it addressed uh, the larger possible variety of people that could actually use uh, this space. So whether this is a male or female or a child or parents, in a way, this, uh, in a way, architecture has, uh, in a way, as much as possible, not, uh, not actually style. So the idea was actually uh, to produce uh, an architecture of, uh, in a way, the individuation, so which will not individuate with the subject, which, uh, in a way, is to inhabit this. And we believe that this is actually uh, the way through which you can really make a space uh, truly collective, in the sense that it's collective because it can be used by different people, it's truly flexible, it's truly interchangeable, and indeed can be used by, as I said, different kind of, of, of social of, of people. <clears throat> so this is uh, uh, the uh, view from the top. You can see that each of the actually room has uh, a large working desk for, let's say, concentration, which is located uh, in, by, in front of actually the windows. Um, each inhabitant is given the same amount of space and the same, actually, uh, uh, same uh, actually furniture. So this is the uh, section. You see the uh, double height space with the, uh, so the space of the, the private individual space uh, at the center, the loggia on, uh, on the right side and the, and the collective working space on the left side. But let's look uh, a, a little bit at the plans. So this is uh, uh, the ground floor plan, so you recognize again uh, the outer private uh, perimeters, while actually the center are located uh, all, uh, let's say, the collective activities, which of course, uh, the idea is to have a, space, a central space which is indeed, uh, in a way, flexible, but also to a certain extent, in the sense that we know that uh, there are, uh, especially being these, uh, let's say, an atelier for artists, there are a series of workshops which uh, 
cannot be you know, interchangeable or change, which uh, you know, are either uh, noisy or dirty or uh, smelly, so which actually need to have a quite a clear defined space. And all these space has been located on, uh, let's say, the, central, the center of the ground floor. While in fact, uh, uh, the upper floor central space is uh, actually more open and, and changeable, thanks to a system of uh, movable partition, which was also an attempt to reveal how, in a way, artistic production uh, or is not always uh, as it has been thought, actually the result of uh, individual thinking and individual uh, imagination, but in fact is very much often the result of collaboration, which is in indeed enhanced by this architecture. So this is the upper floor, with, uh, which has, of course, a skylight, uh, a large skylight view to bring uh, light to the studio space. The section. So a few images of, uh, of the, of the uh, inside space. So you can see, actually, uh, this uh, industrial building with uh, uh, the exposed structure, the inhabitable wall, uh, which are uh, located uh, uh, on the background with the storage space of, in, for each uh, ar artist. And the idea is uh, indeed to have uh, a sort of, uh, to expose the structure of the building so that uh, in the inhabitants are uh, able to modify it and appropriate the building so that actually nothing is concealed, everything is quite uh, visible and uh, can be appropriated, the workshops. But of course a space uh, which uh, indeed is to be used for work but which in fact uh, can also contain uh, uh, leisure or, let's say, activity that belongs more to the sphere of reproduction. Like in this case, of course. The upper floors. And uh, in a way, the villa has, uh, were built as a sort of uh, a prototype which uh, in a way were then uh, tested, located in uh, some of these sites. As I said, some of these are sites are quite uh, spectacular. They are located uh, next to rivers and canals. Um, and certainly, in a way, it's the way we have uh, decided to place this building is uh, something that might look uh, quite indifferent to the condition of the site, but certainly something which is not indifferent to the Social economic condition of actually the city and of the of of the subjects that are meant to live into this architecture. So this is a, a view from the outside with the uh, with the com collective villa, uh, which in fact looks like one of these uh, let's say traditional uh, industrial building that we are so much used to see into these uh, in these locations. And then in the exhibition we have been, uh, and this is to conclude, we have been uh, actually had the opportunity to build uh, a one-to-one -one model of uh, one of these uh, um, structure of one of these, uh, let's say, room or cell for one, uh, for one living, uh, which, uh, <coughs> which had the, uh, the inhabitable wall with the bathroom, the space uh, of work, with the large table, the windows uh, overlooking the outside, The storage space, again inside the working table, and the last uh, image uh, showing the entire, let's say, uh, inhabitable wall. So thanks for your attention. Thank you.